Hi everybody, welcome to my video all about the ASI Air Plus. Now I've had it a little while and got a few nights out. I thought I'd show you how it works and what I think of it. So let's go. The unboxing well there's loads of unboxing videos out there so i'm not really going to go into all that there it is in the box and that's what you get a few cables the asi air plus with external aerial so that's about it for the unboxing really so it doesn't really want a video of itself here's the design so on the left you've got the pro and the pro plus on the right you can see it's a little bit bigger in profile there and of course got the external aerial so similar design slightly bigger and notice there's no air vents on it anymore okay no sd card so you don't have to worry about the sd card because it's got an internal emmc memory built in and that's a reset and auto recovery built in as well so you can recover it if you ever get into real trouble uh, but you of course would have to put in all your settings again so that could be a drawback considering on your, your outlook and of course the external aerial which we're all hoping is going to resolve some of the problems with signal and connecting to wi-fi etc etc so i'll let you know how we get on okay so there's the pro and the pro plus you can see it's slightly thinner so it's a thinner profile seen from that angle again there's no vents on that side of the uh plus and no card slot of course because it's got this emmc memory built in it's a slightly different layout and that caused me a little bit of a problem because I had to rejig everything and everything wasn't quite right putting it together when I swapped the two over. So the different layout may throw the way your cables lie, etc. And attaching the dovetail could be a problem as well. And it is slightly lighter than the Pro 2. So seen from this side where the power ports are, again, there's four power ports, as you can see there, the DSLR trigger port as well and above each of the power ports there's a light to show when they're in use and powered up and again no air vents um unlike the pro on the bottom so yeah that's about it really and then the other side you can see again no vents but it's got the same three quarter inch and one quarter inch mounting holes on that side which is great but if you do use these ports then whatever you attach there is going to get in the way okay so it's got this sd card slot for copying files across um, i don't do that because i use either the uh, usb slot with a card or i map a drive to the uh, asi air plus and download the files on the fly while it's still working so uh, don't have to disturb it and it's got the USB-C port as well for copying files too. So, uh, yeah, but if you put the dovetail or the clamp on that connection, then it's going to obstruct those slots. So, yeah, and again, no air vents. So the other side where the uh, Ethernet and USB ports are is exactly the same. Similar layout, although it looks like they've swapped the uh, USB-3 and the USB-2. So it's got two USB-3 ports and two USB 2 ports, and of course the same Ethernet cable if you connect it hardwired to a network. And first impressions, well, it takes a little bit longer to start up, but that's well documented. The Wi-Fi signal is definitely stronger and much more stable, so I can connect it to my home network, and I can access it from any device or PC using Android emulator within the house, so that's fantastic, and it goes all night, no dropouts. So connect to the home Wi-Fi, access all some Android devices, and then using the Android emulator player on the PC. And it stayed connected, which is fantastic. When I first started it up, it I had to connect it to the its own Wi-Fi and then run the ASI Air app and then straight away updated the firmware on the device and then it started the activation process so it needs activating in the uh, pro plus so i had to connect to the pro plus wi-fi and then click online activation problem is the asi air 
Plus, doesn't have an active internet connection, so you have to swap backwards and forwards while you're doing this process. But it all went really, really quickly. It, so it prompts you to connect it to the internet, so you connect your device back onto your Wi-Fi network, your home Wi-Fi, and then it downloads a code, and then once it's connected, it then saves that, and it's saved to the app or the device, and says activated, and then it's ready to go. And then reconnect back to the ASI Air Plus Wi-Fi, and then you can start setting it up how you want. So first impressions, new uh, features, where well, we've got the power monitor within the app, so you can tell where what's drawing power and where it's going, et cetera, et cetera. And you can check if any accessories are drawing too much current. So if you've got something attached to there that's drawing too much, you can see uh, quite nicely on there how much that's taken out. And one thing that's got a few people I noticed online is when you go to this screen, you have to scroll all the way down to the shutdown button because people are asking where's the shutdown button. So you have to scroll down sometimes to find that button on certain devices. And you can also switch devices as well. So if you've got more than one, you can switch device and swap between one or the other if you're running more than one at a time. So first night's out, what did I find? It's got much the same familiar interface because it is using the same app after all. It recognized all my accessories, although I had to put in all the uh, details again because it doesn't recognize what filters you've got in which filter wheel, etc. And it was perfect plate solving and accurate auto guiding, which I'll show you in a moment. The automatic focuser worked extremely well, and the electronic filter wheel also worked extremely well. No problem at all once I set that up. And no Wi-Fi dropouts. Fantastic. So hopefully, is this dreaded message now resigned to history? We shall see. And I usually got this when I asked the mount to move somewhere, so I'm not quite sure whether that's relevant to what's going on here. Anyway, so far so good. Anyway, so first night's out, modes used were preview, auto run, plan, video, total alignment, and the ones not I didn't test were focus and live. So I'll just briefly run through some of those. So, when I used video mode, I had a very, very faint image trying to do Jupiter. Uh, no matter how I adjusted the gain and the um, exposure, I couldn't get a bright enough image even to focus on Jupiter. So maybe that's uh, user error, um, but we shall see. And the other thing is make sure to use a decent power supply. So make sure you use a recommended power supply because I've found that the one I've been using for my mount some years now, wasn't good enough with all the devices attached camera filter wheel uh, automatic focuser and the juice straps it wouldn't boot properly so it won't start up so make sure you have a decent power supply uh, you, you're spending a lot of money on this gear so why scrimp on a power supply that's going to cause you problems anyway rant over okay so mine wouldn't start with that dodgy power supply that came with my mount all those years ago Anyway, first night's out, right, power port settings, you can adjust here, and if you've got one set to dew heater, you can adjust how strong that is, so how hot those dew heaters straps become, and I found that if you put it up above 0.83 volts or 30%, you actually got a buzz in from the ASI air, so uh, I don't know whether that's going to be a problem, but uh, from what I've seen online, ZWO think that's normal and potentially they may be working on getting rid of that because it never used to happen on my old Pro. And then polar alignment, I tried out last night. So you point the scope towards Polaris in the part position basically, and then it rotates it to right ascension to 60 degrees and then it plate soles as you adjust the azimuth and altitude mount axes. And you get this little target that you're aiming for. And as you get closer, as soon as you get into here, this becomes much bigger. So what you're looking at is a much smaller scale. And I found it quite fiddly to do because it was a bit too sensitive. Um, so if you click this auto refresh 
tick here, it automatically refreshes all the time. But so I did find it a little bit fiddly to use. And you can see it's a little bit of a way out, but it was tracking quite nicely before I adjusted this. So, uh, you know, don't break a gut to get polar alignment done. So I found it very fiddly to get spot on because the slightest adjustment, once you got really close, quickly sent it the other side and you were faffing. I, I was faffing around for quite a long time trying to get it right. And in the end, it says anywhere under two arc minutes is fine. So uh, that's where I left it and it worked really, really well. So uh, I kept open shooting the center spot. And if you get to the point where you really get it really tip top polar lined, it shows you how well you fared against other users um i managed to get 57 percent, so i don't think that's too bad on the first outing but even so it's uh yeah there's a lot of faff. Uh, but make sure this auto is ticked because that was quite difficult to see in uh, the app i was using in the emulator it looks easy here but in the emulator it was a lot more difficult because the writing under here was sort of on beneath it and it sort of merged into the background Auto focusing, the electronic automatic focuser, that worked really well. Most of the time I need to work on this. Uh, so it takes a series of exposures. You see the uh, graph it's drawing here. So along here, you've got the star size plotted against the position of the focuser. And you can see as it's moving in this direction, it's coming down. It measures the star sizes on the stars and then determines the best focus position from the graph. So you can see here, this is just before it determined the uh, exact focus. So it measures star sizes and determines the best focus position. So where the star is the smallest size, that's the best focal position. But it doesn't always work. It's not infallible. Um, this is the refocus after I changed to the hydrogen alpha filter on one of the uh, images that I took last night and you can see it didn't quite work but I think that might be the settings that I've used I think I need need to increase the size or the length of the exposure to get it to be able to focus properly on a star um, with that filter because it doesn't let very much light through uh, I call that an ID10T error so uh, got to do better Dave okay Multi-star guiding, absolutely fantastic, but the Pro was as well. So uh, very quick calibration. It was last night anyway. And then you get these multi-stars. You get your main guiding star here, plotted with the green cross we're used to getting in PhD. And then, of course, you've got these other stars highlighted as well, which is your multi-star guiding. So the best auto guiding I've seen, and it was below 04 of an arc second at some points um, on the total down here so you can see the graph of the auto guiding as it goes um, and it just works it's just absolutely lovely so uh, yeah fantastic i did have trouble a couple of nights ago because there were clouds scudding across so every now and again it'll lose the guide stars but uh, apart from that it just seems to work but i have noticed that if you dither between your images you can get this total does creep up quite a bit. And you can see the dither where it moves a number of pixels in between each image uh, to get better images once you've stacked them. This total does go up. So I'm not sure whether the tracking is actually worse after the dither or whether that movement shown by the dither is taken into account into that figure. So there's just something I've noticed as we go. Yep, so best auto garden I've seen, it just works, but passing clouds did give some hiccups, as you can see here. So here's a few images taken with the plus since I've had it. So this is an LRGB image taken of the wild duck cluster, fairly low down in the sky, but I thought I'd give it a go. Come out quite nicely. Crescent Nebula in Hydrogen Alpha. Cassiopeia Ghost really needs some more um, data to get a really, really smooth image out of that and the bubble nebula a bit brighter so it came out a little bit better uh, than that and then the dealic group ngc 7331 in pegasus again i got five exposures before cloud stop play so very grainy image but you can see the detail in the galaxy quite nicely and you can see its little friends gathered around it as well and um, the elephant truck nebula in hydrogen alpha so that was quite nice so i'm looking forward to adding some o3 and some sulfur 2 data it should be two not one 
data to that as well so i can get a hubble um, palette image out of that going forward so lots to do lots of fun so what do i think is it worth upgrading well if you've got an aap pro does it work for you are you happy with the features it's got then no it's not worth upgrading to the plus at the moment there are a few features but it's not a big game changer is wi-fi signal on your pro a real problem does it keep dropping out and getting that disconnect do you want some of the new features that it's got and do you want to be ready for some of the new features that zwo we think are planning in the background to make it even better than it is then yes it will be worth upgrading but you've got a long wait for it to come because they're not going to be shipped before the end of this year perhaps next year but we shall see so uh, my overall conclusions are i just love the plus and i love the pro as well so you know they work just as well as each other they're fantastic and they've transformed my imaging the plus is a lot more stable on my home wi-fi no dropouts at all and if you have a zwo camera or supported dslr i really would highly recommend that you get one because they are fantastic really really nice easy to use and it just works okay so that's about it hope you enjoyed my rundown of the asi air plus and see you again take care folks bye